Matthias Valentine and Dominic, Dominic uh, Charlesa from Tensier. And given that uh, broker is one of the main features of Bro 2.6, I'm all excited uh, about seeing uh, a real world uh, use case of uh, broker. So I give you Dominic and Mirias. So I think I spoiled it already. <laughs> so um, yeah, we don't know about this yet, but we're excited to be here. And last year, Dominic and I, we co-founded Tenzir primarily because of you, the Zeek community. We are really uh, excited and we realize that there's a pain point though that deserves closer attention and that's making network forensics viable at scale. So think about writing Zeek scripts. It's pretty powerful to have all that access to the data, but in comparison, wrangling those massive amounts of logs, net flows, and pickups is a hassle. And our goal is that integrating this historic data become seamless and efficient so that you have actionable insight at your fingertips. And on this mission, one building block is broker, which we're going to talk about here now. And Dominic and I were quite involved in the design and implementation of broker. And in this talk, we want to show you how it fits into the Zeek ecosystem. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thanks, Matthias. So just to make sure everyone is on the same page, I'd like to give a quick recap what Broker is and why we need it. So most of you probably know this picture. You have a tab for getting data into Zeek, and then Zeek gives visibility to the analyst. To keep up with high bandwidth, many users run Zeek in a cluster. And then managers and workers exchange valuable insight to establish a global view of your network. And what if we could tap into this resource and see everything Zeek sees, uh, sees itself? Historically, Zeek's approach to communicate uh, looked like this. You had that um, Zeek started a second process for communication to other Zeek instances. And then we had Broccoli, which was a re-implementation of Zeek's protocol for tapping into the communication. However, persistent state was missing in the picture, and there was little control over data flow. Now, let's jump to the present and start talking about Broker. Broker establishes a unified access to events. Events are usually network activity, but can also be generated from scripts. Broker provides a persistent key value store that allows you to manage state. It gives you a very flexible publish-subscribe communication layer, and it enables cross-correlation. This means correlation of real-time events and historic data is possible, and this is something we look into in our demo later. The architecture of Broker is actually straightforward. It combines a publish-subscribe communication layer with data stores and replication. So here, the blue circles represent broker endpoints. Each line is a peering relation. Um, data flows through the peering relations back and forth. Endpoints not only provide publish-subscribe communication, but users can also attach key value stores. And finally, you can add clones that act as caches to get more performance out of your system because you don't have to ask the master all the time, but you have a cache that's just sitting on your machine and forwards data more efficiently. We've seen the historical perspective on Zeek. So now let's talk about what's going to happen with Zeek 2.6. Broker is a C++ library, and Bro no longer needs a separate process. Instead, Broker provides this as a library that you can just link to, so it sits in the same process. All you need to do is link against this library, and this means you can just write a C++ application, grab the library, and you're, on, you're in the publish-subscribe communication. Or, if you prefer, you can also use Python, for example, for rapid prototyping, or if you simply prefer having a scripting language. If you are regularly visiting Brocon, then this isn't the first time you hear about Broker. In 2015, Robin presented the first prototype. Then we took some lessons we learned with the first prototype. Matthias iterated on it and added non-blocking API in 2016. 
and also presented on the Brocon. And then last year, following Matthias, I addressed several scalability issues, scalability issues by integrating stream processing in 2017 and talked about this at the Brofor Pro conference last year. And this year, we finally have a stable release that we can encourage everyone to try. And of course, all of this wouldn't be happening without John. He did most of the heavy lifting. He is the maintainer of Broker, and he makes sure you have a repository that is up and compiles. So what does the current release look like? Good news is Broker is tested and live in master. So you can just check out the latest 2.6 and you get Broker. You have access to C++ and Python APIs, whichever you prefer. You have the topic-based publish subscribe topologies that we see in a bit in the demo. And you have the key value stores with configurable backends. Right now there is in-memory, RocksDB, and uh, SQLite. What we currently don't have is access to Zeek logs through broker. This is just a limitation of the current system. There is nothing inherently prohib prohibiting it. So I hope by now you have a rough idea of what broker is. So Matthias will show you what you can do with it. Okay, let's get our hands dirty. So consider the following scenario. Bro sends logs to some sort of log storage. And if you have a more elaborate setup, you also have an intelligence feed. And as new Intel arrives, Bro can incorporate it into its processing. But another interesting question is, when you look at new Intel, um, you can go back in time and realize, hey, this new Intel, we just learned about it, but did it hit us in the past already? And it's usually the analyst then that does that by crawling through the archives and finds out potentially, oh, geez, I was already there for six months, six weeks, so maybe six months. What if we could automate this? If Broad does that every time new Intel comes out, searches, goes back in time, and tells you essentially on the spot when and where this happened. So that's the scenario. We want to build this with Broker. And instead of a log store, what we use here is VAST. So VAST stands for visibility across space and time. That was my dissertation project when I was at UC Berkeley, where I had the good fortune of being advised by the Zeek executor officer, Vern. And um, since I've talked about it in past Procons already, I'll just summarize it briefly for now. We consider it as a open source data plane for network forensics, not on an incredibly feature-rich, not in a incredibly feature-rich feature -rich way, but more so in a minimal and high-performance aspect. It's optimized for longitudinal queries, not just searching in a specific time frame, but also in space, such as point queries of IP addresses um, over large data sets. And it has native support for the Seek and PCAP, and we're currently working on integrating it with uh, big data frameworks so that it's more of a programmatic way to get to your data. And we're seeking for alpha testers. So we're at the point where this is um, soon to be available. And if you want to um, be involved, just um, yeah, talk to us. We are, that's what we're currently developing here at Tinsier. So let's get back to our scenario where this is what we are building with Broker, but let's keep the intelligence uh, framework for now out and we add that in back later. Now just about Bro doing the historic lookup to some data store. By the way, all of our code is available on GitHub and also uh, you, can, yeah, you can check it out there if this is now too much. But let's start with the version one. So instead of having Bro and the log store communicate, we'll mock it with two Python stubs. And uh, each Python process contains a broker endpoint. That's the unit of communication. So one endpoint listens at a specific TCP um, port, and the other connects to it. And once they're connected, they peer. And peering in broker means topics, topic exchanges. It's a public publish subscribe architecture. And we have, uh, in our setup, two topics. One is a control topic and one is a data topic to encode two different channels. It's, um, and as the peering takes place, the 
topics are exchanged so that when Vast uh, publishes results, it will send them to Bro. And when uh, Bro wants to send a query, it knows that it will send it to the Vast endpoint. And the protocol that we are implementing is quite simple. Bro sends a query in, in a query event, and Vast then sends back the results uh, one by one in an event. And uh, at the end, yeah, terminates. This was, OK, now let's look at how the Vast Python stub looks like. This is the full script, except for the import statements. So you can fit all on one slide. It's, uh, as Jeff said, it's four lines only. <laughs> You, all you do have to do in Python is create yourself an endpoint and create a subscriber. So here, um, the subscriber, uh, make subscriber function gets a list of topics, and then the endpoint listens and waits until it's connection. This function is blocking. And once somebody connected, uh, you, have, you have peering, and then what we do in this example here is all we do is loop and wait for commands, and the subscriber.get call is blocking, what, what we get from it is a topic and a data pair. That's a message in Broker. And because we want to make this work with Bro, we have this additional small Bro shim that we just used, that we, we interpret the data as a Bro event by uh, calling broker.bro.event on it, on the data. And that gives us access to, um, yeah, the same way Bro would process an event with a, has a name and a list of arguments. And in this case, what comes, what arrives at Vast is the query event from Bro. And it has the query ID and the expression. So what Vast does with this stuff is it answers the query. And now for this Python script, all I'm doing is just generating some data. It's, uh, there's this uh, function called make result event that creates a Bro compatible event of some dummy data with the, with the query ID that it uh, was sent. And so here I just generate 10 different results. I publish it to the data channel. And then when I'm done, uh, I create an event with none data in it to signal, OK, this is, this is over. This is the entire script. And let's look how the Zeek stub looked like, the other side. And here we start with the same way. We create a broker endpoint, create a subscriber. This time we are subscribing to the data channel, not the control channel. And we are peering with, uh, with the vast side. What we then do is we create a query. And here is, again, the, we create a bro event, bro compatible event. And we namespace it with a module here, vast colon colon query. Then we send the randomly generated query ID and a query along with it. Then we publish it to the control channel, and it arrives at Vast. And so Zeek is now waiting for the results to come back to be integrated into the processing. Again, we have a we just loop. We we call it subscriber.get, and um, with the result, we unwrap it again. We interpret it as a bro event, and we print it to standard output. And once uh, we realize the result is none, we're done. So it's. Uh, this is the blocking API. There's also non-blocking versions, but you know this is how you would start rapidly prototyping your application. So let's let's have a uh, look at how we how we can do this. Okay, just going to show you. I've shown you pretty much all the code already. It's just I want to prove that it works. Oh. Actually, that was, let's see. That's what I want you to see. Now, can you see this or not? I don't think you can see anything, right? OK, let's mirror the displays for now, then. OK, so on the bottom half of the script, I have, <coughs> I have uh, 
Bast running, and at the top I have the stubs. So it's very simple. What we have this little Python script that has both implementations, and I'm certainly going to say, I'm going to call start the Bast stub. Uh, all it does is waits for commands, so the bro will send um, the query, and Bast generates some dummy data, and back comes the result. So, okay, this is, is that readable or? It's not, I mean, it's not very exciting, but to just give you the idea that it, it works, this is the full script, very simple. Okay, let's get back to the demo, to the talk. I mean. Okay, now that we have the two Python stops, what you would typically do is now implement the real thing. So we, we replace our one of the side of the stubs with actual bro. And okay, everything stays the same, we just use we write the script again in seek. Damn it, I said bro. Okay, so what we have here is in bro init, we subscribe to the, uh, the data channel, and then we establish a peering. And once the peering is established, bro generates this event called peer added. And in this event, what we do is start by issuing the query. We query the log store, and uh, we generate a new event, and the function broker colon colon make event generates that event. It takes three arguments. The first argument is an actual um, bro event, and all you have to do is declare it prior to its use so that the type system knows how to process it and does the type checking. And, and then you give it the parameters. Here's the query ID and the expression. Should have been a string literal. And you publish it over to the other side. And as we've seen, what the stub does then, it, it sends back the result data. And that's just another event. So that's the that's the vast event here. We get the query ID and the data, and data here is broker data. And as of bro26, you can do, um, you can apply the switch statement not only to values, but also to, uh, to types. So essentially, you can dispatch on the type of an any data by calling uh, case type. And what we do here is, if it's not a vector of data, we terminate the program. So that's a very simple way of just being done. But if it's a vector of any, we print out the result on standard out. That's what the prior stub did as well. So that's, that's the entire script. Let's look at this again. Where is my terminal? Okay, so we actually So we, we launch the Python stub again, vast, and now what we do is run the bro script. So same thing, vast answered the query, but now we called it from bro. Everything works as before. So we have now replaced one side of the communication with, with bro. Okay, what's missing? Obviously it's the other end. So let's replace that with vast, and in this case what we did, we wrote a C++, uh, utility that's a small bridge that acts between the two systems and uh, speaks broker on one side and with VAST speaks CAF. And um, we're using CAF because the architecture of VAST, by the way, this is also in, in the repository, it's open source, you can have a look at it if you need, want to use it as a template, um, is such that CAF is the basis for broker and um, also for VAST. And bro sits on top of broker, and, but VAST uses both um, broker and CAF. So let's have a look at how you would do that instead of, what we do is first of all, we, we start VAST. That's preloaded with a 500 megabyte trace for now, just to have some dummy data in there. Then we launch the Bro to VAST utility that connects first to VAST. And uh, what we do then is we run the Bro script. And in this case, it's VAST Okay, so here comes now back some actual data. So as you can see from, from the data format, this, uh, this looks like a bro DNS log that came back. So we, we're actually now querying logs from bro. Okay. 
okay, this is what we have so far. Let's look at the final piece. It's incorporating intelligence. And, oh, yeah, we're switching back to the terminal again. So we have written a package that, that does and implements all that logic. And just to give you an idea what, it, what we're doing here is we, have, uh, we hook in the Intel framework. So whenever new Intel arrives, and currently that's actually a pretty hackish way to do, sorry. Uh, sorry, Seth, that I'm showing this. I didn't want to show it, but I have to, I think. And um, the, here we're actually going to the namespace of the Intel framework and uh, hooking new item event. And whenever we have a new Intel arriving and we have a connection to VASP, we perform the lookup. But if we don't have a connection, we queue the item. So that's just what this helper function does. It, it, if, it's, if we have it already, uh, a connection, then we can do the lookup directly and otherwise uh, not. So this is the implementation of this queue or lookup. Um, if we're connected to that VASP bridge, uh, we perform the lookup, but otherwise we add the uh, Intel item to the set. So when it comes available, it uh, will process it automatically. And when the system starts up, it does that. In. So here's the event bridge up, which is just a small wrapper around broker peer added. So whenever we have a new peer and it happens to be our bridge, we get this event. So when, and then for all the unprocessed items that are in there, we perform the historic interlookup. And that's essentially just it's the same thing. And first of all, we create a specific expression, a query expression for the intel item that arrived. And uh, currently, we're just looking at bro con locks. This is going to get a bit more sophisticated in the future. But that's how it looks like. And uh, yeah, so, so that once we have that expression, we, uh, we perform the lookup. And the lookup function is is, yeah, it's creating the same thing. It does doing the same thing. It creates a broker event, uh, publishes it, and returns the query ID so that it can be kept and, uh, yeah, state associated with it. Um, let's, I'll show you some example Intel file real quick. So, well, small terminal. Okay, essentially, that's, that's the format of the Intel framework. You have an indicator. In this case, it's an IPv6 address, and it's of type Intel adder, and we can associate some metadata with it. In this case, just dummy data in there. So that's the Intel file that we want to load. And um, so I'm going to just run bro right now with this, with this uh, file, this example Intel file. And I use the intelligence framework the Intel option to read files. So I add this file to the, to the list of files to be read on startup, and I'm also dumping the logs in JSON format. And here's the, the script that I'm loading. It's the Intel, the Perl script inside of the package. I just want to make sure I'm deleting all logs before doing this, so OK. Um, uh, read. OK. So there we go. Um, bro started and then added on bro in it the example Intel to the list of unprocessed Intel items. And then once the bridge came up, it immediately performed the query and it returned in uh, 180 milliseconds. So now let's have a look at how and what this package does. It creates a new log file, historic Intel.log. It has, looks like a connection record here, and we have the con log style ID or ridge uh, and responder fields. But we also have then the indicator tied to it. And in this case, it's the IP source address. It, uh, there's a double H field and the H string. So there's a small, this one actually, since it's a trace from the M57 um, setup, that was H eight years ago that this Intel was there. So it's really just an example, but it tells you immediately here in the log file, oh, by the way, the, this Intel we had eight years ago already. And yeah, this is, this is the log file. It's just, just an example. Um, can get arbitrarily complex. It's a bro package. All you have to do is bro package install bro last. All right. <laughs> Let's go back to mirror. Now that we have seen Broker running, 
The next question is, how does it actually perform? And that was the question we asked ourselves when we were building the demo. We also took a closer look at the system, and in particular the performance of the system. Um, we have identified two communication patterns for our demo that were very relevant, and that are also very common, which are this request-response type of communication, where you have your, in our demo case, we have bro looking something up, and then vast responding. So the question is, how um, performs bro broker in the first case? And then the second part is the streaming of the results, because whatever vast finds, it will send you all the data through broker. So we have these two aspects, and then we tried measuring these two communication patterns in microbenchmarks. In particular, we are looking at latency for the first kind of communication between lookup and answer, and throughput for the second type of communication, which is just the bare raw amount of data that flows, can flow through the system in the second case. Just for the sake of completeness, this is the box we've been using. It has 64 hardware threads. If you include hyperthreading, then it has 500 gigabytes RAM, it runs Linux, and we started all broker nodes on the same machine to get the network out of the way. Our first micro benchmark looks at latency. For this, we have used two nodes on the left ping and then pong. We measured time between send and receive on ping, so ping sends the data. It gets something back, and we measure how much time has passed. And also, we have added relay nodes that forward traffic between ping and pong, because in broker, you can have a tree, so you can have multiple nodes between ping and pong. And we, we are varying payload sizes and the number of relays. And the expectation is that the latency grows as the number of relays grows, because for each hop you have in between ping and pong, you have one extra hop you need to travel while communicating. So here's the result. This graph shows our result for the first latency measurement. The y-axis shows round trip time at milliseconds, and the x-axis shows number of relays from 0 to 10. The purple line here depicts the setup using one megabyte payload. It's about 10 times slower as the blue line, which shows one megabyte payload. This, of course, makes sense. If you have 10 times the data, it should make sense that it takes 10 times longer. However, we don't really see what's going on down here, so let's zoom into this part. And here we see the blue line is now one megabyte, and down below we have the everything below 100 kilobyte, which all behave very similarly. And in this range of one megabyte, the copying overhead takes over. So what we really see it at one megabyte is just copying of this one megabyte payload, and the other, uh, the other lines show only a very small penalty for adding additional relay relays to latency. So with our second microbenchmark, we look at the throughput of our system instead of ping and pong. This time, we have a source and a sync, and messages can only flow one way now. We have, again, um, measured messages per second received by sync. So now we don't have round trips. We just look at the sync, how much data flows in. And again, we vary number of relays from 0 to 10, and we also vary the payloads again. Expectation this time is that the throughput should remain constant, while it now, if we add relays, it should take longer for the first packet to arrive. It shouldn't really affect how much per second flow in total through the system. So this graph shows our result for the throughput latency. This time, the y-axis shows throughput measured in messages per second. And on the x-axis, you again see the number of relays. This time, we see the group from 0 to 100 bytes <coughs> close together. And 1 kilobytes up to 1 megabyte um, are again um, close together, which the small payloads are at the top and the large payloads are at the bottom, and one kilobyte is somewhere hang in the, hanging in the middle. So this is messages. Now let's look at just payload bytes per second. And here we essentially invert the order of our lines. We, if we have larger payloads, we can in total have more throughput for the system. 
And of course, if you have very small payloads, you have less data overall because you have a lot of overhead per byte that you are transferring. So this kind of makes sense. Here, the payloads from 100 bytes and below behave very similarly. It's either red and orange lines. The pub sub layer, to be fair, is not designed for transferring large data. That's not a point. But of course, it's still interesting to look at this. And we clearly see that our system does not behave ideal. Because if we add relay, we see less throughput. So after we produce the results, we've gone back to our expectations. The latency behaved how we expected it to behave. It only increases for large payloads. This is when the copying overhead just kicks in. And for each hop you travel, you have to copy additional data. But throughput is affected by increasing the number of relays, which really doesn't make a lot of sense to us. So to understand the system behavior, we made some flame graphs of our relays in order to see where the time is spent. So now let's switch over to the flame graph. And for those of you that aren't familiar with flame graphs, it's just a visualization tool for where uh, time is spent in your functions. The colors don't mean anything. It's just to differentiate the functions. And you have your call stack. So this large tower is just a stack of functions where each on the below, uh, where each function below calls the one up. And then you have this um, mountain. And on the x-axis, you have the time. So let's look at, for example, this down below here. This function here, this is called SHA1 block whatever. It takes total of 18.5%. And this is, to us, not very interesting because it's just OpenSSL. If we look here, um, these functions are all OpenSSL related. And if we scroll the unarray, here we have some AES functions that's OpenSSL as well. So that's not really something that interests us because we are just using OpenSSL, but it's still interesting that OpenSSL uses so much time. So what's left here, what our application is actually doing, um, it's a CAF application, so you will see a lot of CAF function names, but I try to um, give you a broad picture of what's going on. So here are three mountains, if you will. Um, I go from left to right, so we look at this large um, tree, mountain, whatever you want to call it, first. And if we look at what this is doing, then we see here some CAF I.O. functions. So this is CAF networking components that are um, using the time. And here in particular, we have this um, CAF message that we can zoom in. If you click on it, it just blends everything out but the function you're looking at. So this is message safe. So we are looking at serialization. This is a message that goes out to another relay or to the sync, or Pong in this case. And if we look what's being serialized here, we can go up until we find this um, serialized thingy, which gets a broker data. So this is serialization of some broker data that travels through the system. And at the very top, we have just one function that's using all the time, and this is a copy. This is a standard library copy function call which um, at the end of the day is responsible for most of this time. So zooming out again, we look at the second thing. Let me zoom in here. This is, um, again, cuff, cuff stuff. Let me click on this. Then we have the closer view at this. And this is the other side. So this is a message load call. So this is a deserialization. And if you remember, let me just um, if you remember the sizes, this deserialization takes a lot of less time than a serialization, which doesn't make a lot of sense. And here, um, at, the very bot uh, at the very top, we again have some memmove function, but this time it takes much, much, much less time. So the serialization, oops, the serialization seems to be one issue. And now let's go to this side of the flame graph. Here we can zoom in on. This is essentially just noise, even though this is um, this um, this function is called walk ceiling DQ. This is just some um, scheduling artifact in CAF. That's not interesting. But if we zoom in this part, 
then we see this is some something in broker that is using the time, and this is the broker endpoint. So it's in CAF terminology, the broker endpoint is just an actor in the system, and here we see this um, CAF stream manager push. This is just in CAF where the broker relay gets data and shoves it into the next stream. And this is not reasonable that this is taking so much time because all the relay is doing is it gets something from the wire and gives it back to the wire again. So there shouldn't be much CPU spent anywhere other than serialization and deserialization. So that seems to be one problem as well. So that's the first quick um, look into the flame graph. So let's get back to the slides. Okay, the flame graph uh, was the first step for us to investigate what's going on in, in broker. And after that, we took close looks at individual components and measured those pieces individually. Um, I spare you the details on that. You have seen in the flame graphs what we have identified, and then we, look, uh, we took what we learned with the flame graph analysis, and we found in the serialization part, we found, we found just some inefficient code. Good news is we already have a patch for this, and after the patch, this just no longer shows up in the flame graph. And if you remember the last thing I showed you, this bottleneck in the endpoint, this potential bottleneck in the, in the um, endpoint, the flame graph was from a relay with a small payload. So if we increase the payload, this bottleneck gets even worse. What we did here was we reproduced this behavior in a mock-up where we just stripped down what is going on in the endpoint, made a little application that did nothing else, and then we developed a strategy to fix this issue. Um, in our mock-up, with the fix, we get a stable throughput rate, which is what we want and expect. The bad news here is this is not a trivial patch for broker, and it might affect the API. So just not something we can just um, push into master back right away. So what did we learn today? Hopefully, we did learn something. And to conclude this, um, broker enables new use cases and integrations. We have looked in our demo at an automated into automating workflows. For example, you have Intel insights that trigger historic queries so that the analyst doesn't have to do all this all by himself or scripting by himself, but has this at, as part of his uh, Zeek workflow automated. And we have very straightforward integration with tools like Bast with the new broker, broker API, which very nicely um, also allows us uh, rapid prototyping with the Python API. This is the stuffs we have building where you can just have a very quick setup for getting something to run, and then you can plug in the pieces that you develop one by one. Um, latency already looks good in, in Broker, so if you set up the system, the initial time it takes to travel through the system is very reasonable, and the one thing that has room for improvement is currently throughput in Broker. Okay, with that we conclude, and thank you for listening, and we are happy to answer questions.